fight the Republicans and win. And they're not dumb, those Republicans. Who have they been attacking for a year? Not somebody they don't want to run against. I mean, and not somebody they want to run against. You know, if they really thought they could push her over, they'd be begging you to nominate her. They're not dumb. <laughs> The, uh, you gotta give it to the Republicans. I mean, they think about this all the time. Power, 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 power. And their strategy never changes. Distract, divide, and demonize. But you'll be fine with that. But here's why I want to say that it's important. We all more or less agree on what should be done. There are some meaningful disagreements about how best to reduce risk in the financial system and how to do what's important, which is to get money out of speculation back into investment in American jobs and businesses and people. There are some differences about what the best strategy on health care is. But only one candidate can be commander-in-chief on day one in a complicated time that will keep America safe without sacrificing our constitution and character. Only one person has long time experience in actually doing the kind of development work that will rebuild the middle class, reduce poverty, and allow us to go together again. Only one person is given a lifetime to the kind of women and children and family issues that are at the heart of all these family problems, beginning with the opioid and heroin epidemic. So, my last argument for you is that. When I was president, I spent a lot of time reading the history of my predecessors, including ones that aren't famous, ones that only served one time, ones that succeeded spectacularly and ones that failed often. A few of the people who had that job, just a couple, were dumb. <laughs> You know, not many, one or two. <laughs> a couple were lazy, but not many. A couple, as we all know, were too tolerant of corruption, but not many. Most people you elect president actually are intelligent, tell you what they're going to try to do, and if you elect them, they try to do what they say they're going to do. Which, if you listen to the other guys today, is a truly frightening perspective. <laughs> but you, you've got to assume that. So the trick is, who will be, who's best suited for the times in which the elections are going? We need somebody to bring back the economy, deal with the problems that are tearing us apart, keep the country safe, protect the president's gains, and give us a political system that works again, beginning with making three, one and three appointments to the U.S. Supreme Court. That will be done soon. I've been doing this a long time, and I know you can discount what I say because I, I love it. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary, but look, we're about to become grandparents again. about this. Remember, it's the only time in 50 years that we all grew together when I was there. If that's what you want, you need a change maker. Somebody that can stand the ground but find common ground. And in my lifetime, she's the best change maker I've ever known. Long before she's ever elected anything, she just made good things happen for people like you. She got out of law school. Hard for young women today to imagine, but women were in a terrible minority among law students in the early 70s. She could have gone anywhere, taken any kind of fancy job. She went to work for the Children's Defense Fund. They sent her to Alabama to see if she could prove that these so-called new academies, which were claiming tax exemptions, were nothing more than segregated schools trying to ignore the Supreme Court order and integrate our schools. So she posed in a little town in North Alabama. She posed as a mom moving to town and said, will you take my child in your school? 
And when they said yes, she said, I just want to know one thing. Is this going to be an all-white school? And the guy said, well, of course she had it. <laughs> and everybody knew this was the case, but we didn't have them on record. It's kind of like when Congressman McCarthy said the most important achievement of the Republican Congress was they drove Hillary's number down with that Benghazi committee. And then he couldn't be speaker anymore because he told the truth. It's a terrible thing to have a party that has to eliminate people from leadership for telling the truth. <laughs> I fell in after the Republicans. I almost went to vote for McCarthy. I'll figure Gordon is on most. But anyway, she did that. She never been elected anything. She went to South Carolina to find out how come so many African American teenagers were being held for years and years and years in adult prisons, ruining their lives, cutting off all hope of a better future, having nothing to do with keeping people safe. That report, too, was part of a movement by the Children's Defense Fund that led to change sentencing requirements, not just for African Americans, but for young people all over the country. It just made things better. She came to Arkansas and started the first legal aid program we'd ever had in the mountains of North Arkansas. The judge didn't like it at first. And he didn't like her for doing it. But within six months, he changed his mind. Because when poor people got good representation, they won when they should have won. They were acquitted when they should be acquitted. When they were convicted, they could no longer have their conviction thrown out for having a bad lawyer. And when she was 29 years old, she was elected. President Carter put her on the board of the National Legal Services Corporation. She was elected chair at 29. She's still the youngest person ever to hold that job. She just made good things happen. Then when I became governor, she came literally skipping into the room where I was sitting one day. And she said, Bill, I just found something wonderful. We had six of the poorest counties in America, 20 poorest counties in America. Three were predominantly African American in the Mississippi Delta. Three were in our Appalachia in the mountains of North Arkansas. She said, we got all these kids starting the school, unready to learn, and their parents are poor and they have no education, and most of them are illiterate. And keep in mind, there was no kindergarten, no pre-kindergarten, no child care standards, nothing. And she said, I found this program in Israel because they got all these people coming in from Ethiopia and other places who don't speak Hebrew or English. So they teach their parents to be their kids' first teacher. It strengthens the bond the kids go to school. They're working. It's working better. I said, well, that's great. What are we going to do about it? She said, oh, I did it. I called the woman who started the program. She'll be here in 10 minutes. <laughs> Because this woman in Israel will get to become an Arkansas. She probably thought she was going to the South Pole. <laughs> Before I know it, she's dragging me around to these little graduation ceremonies for this home improvement program for preschool youngsters. You can see the parents full of pride. You can see the kids standing upstream. You can see that it's different. Pretty soon, this program's in 26 states. Today, it's still thriving all across America. Today, there are now thousands of young adults all over this country who started school better prepared to learn, who learned more in school, and have been able to make more of their lives. Because she did something as a private citizen, never been elected at anything more than 30 years ago. Everything she ever touches, she makes better. That's what she wanted to tell us. to carry Iowa, not he too, not because of politics, because of something she did. A court told us our school funding was too unequal in Arkansas. I was mad, A, because it's true, and B, because it gave me the political clout I needed to raise the school standards, to raise teacher pay, and to raise the money to fund it. I put her in charge of the program. She did such a good job with going all over the state and getting these things together and building support that the chairman of our legislative committee on education said, after she reported, I think maybe we elected the wrong one go. <laughs> they implemented the standards. Now, what they got to do with me being elected and I was voting for me, because when I came here in 92, I told the following story. I said, before we adopted our school standards in 1983, 
A national expert said we had the worst schools in America. Nine years later, he said the two most improved school systems in the country are Arkansas and South Carolina. You ought to vote for me because I did that. But I didn't. She did. <laughs> and she never felt like it did anything. She just made something good happen. And our kids needed it. And it changed the possible life outcomes for thousands of people. When she got elected, when I got elected president, she was in the White House. We tried to pass health care reform. If you follow it last time, you know you only pass health care reform. If you have 60 votes to make her film, but on the other side, we, didn't, we had 55 votes. We didn't have 60 votes. So she didn't give up. She and Senator Kennedy worked on the Children's Health Insurance Program. They got it put in a balanced budget bill. So when I signed the balanced budget bill, I also signed a bill that provided health care to more than 5 million children. The Children's Health Insurance Program is still a part of the National Health Care Program. She did that. Then she started really showing she could get stuff done with the Republicans. Of all the Republicans in Newt Gingrich's house, the pre-Tea Party Tea Party Congress, the one that disliked me the most was Tom Delight, the House Republican. He was a tough guy. And he thought I had betrayed the cause of white Southern Protestant men who were all supposed to be right-wing Republicans. I had walked away from my heritage. He didn't like me very much. <laughs> so here we come for the second time in our married life related to work. She comes dancing in the room again. She said, I found it, I found it. I said, what'd you find? She said, I found the human streak in Tom Delaney. I said, do tell. She, and she got very serious. She said, Bill, he's an adopted parent and he loves his children. And we had a terrible problem there. We had all these kids stuck in foster care, and nobody wanted to adopt them if they got past infancy because they were afraid they couldn't have any influence on them anymore. And all these kids were aging out of foster care at 18, just being thrown in the streets. No college to go to, no skills training program, no housing allowances, no nothing. She and the lady wrote a new bill. It passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. And by the, by the time I left office, we had increased adoptions out of foster care by 65%. She did that, and she made me work in it. She did the same thing with Republican farmers on Long Island when she was a senator. Small manufacturers that she got in e-commerce for the first time. When New York was devastated by 9-11, she asked President Bush to commit $20 billion. A lot of people in his party didn't want to do it. He said, I'll do it. And they worked together. They got every last penny, and we needed it. I noticed she was criticized in one of those debates. You may remember this. For mentioning it, saying, oh, she played the 9-11 card. She wasn't. She was making the point that the people who were devastated on 9-11 were people to her not categories. One woman she became very close to went through 12 or 13 plastic surgeries. This thing went on and on. The first responders were getting sick still from the junk they were exposed to, wading through the wreckage of 9-11. But she stayed with them all the way. And they still are getting care and compensation so they can make the most of the life that they've had. When she became the only New Yorker ever to serve on the Armed Services Committee because we're home of Fort Brown, where the 10th Mountain Division is, and they're deployed everywhere. She worked with Lindsey Graham, who briefly ran for the Republican nomination, to get National Guard people the same health care regular service people did if they were deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. She went with Senator John McCain taking Republican doubters about climate change all over the world, to the northernmost village on Earth in Norway, to the northernmost town in America in Alaska, Point Barrow, where the Eskimos wept and told them they had to believe in global warming. It was ending their way of life. Thousands of years old. She did it together. 
One day I was in the Congress on my foundation work, and a handsome young military guy came to me and said, you don't know me, but he said, I represent the Pentagon in Congress. And I thought you'd like to know that we believe that your wife knows more about our business than any member of either House of Congress in either party. She gets it. She knows what these young men and women are up against. She knows what pressures the families are taking. She gets us protection we can. We're glad to have her. She's the number one authority on this. That's what she's done with everything all her life. She just makes something good happen. And that's what you need. The Secretary of State, the one thing that survives, our falling out with President Putin is something called the New Start Treaty. It reduces the threat of nuclear war, reduces warheads, reduces delivery. It had to be ratified. First, you had to get Putin to agree to it. Then it had to be ratified by 67 senators. That is a lot of Republicans. Can you imagine 67 senators voting for anything the administration wants today? She got it passed. With the help of Senator Dick Luger, a Republican from Indiana. She got the Iran sanctions passed. They made this nuclear deal possible. Even the people that hate the deal like the sanctions. She got Russia and China to agree. And I could go on and on and on. Last summer, we're very partial to the Irish. You know, and some of you, if you're Irish, you know that we ended the war in Northern Ireland, essentially, and made a, what we hoped would be a lasting peace. And Hillary was very active in it when I was president. We just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Irish ceasefire. Last summer, we were on vacation, and I went by a party that had nothing to do with politics. This guy comes up to me, I don't know him. He said, you don't know me, do you? I said, no. He said, that's because I was not in government when you were there, but I was the British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland when Hillary was there. In 2010, we nearly lost the Irish peace. After 12 years of progress, we nearly lost it. Nobody would talk to anybody. You were gone. You weren't in public life anymore. So he said,